Hey folks, good afternoon. Um, this technology thing for an old guy gets a little confusing. So I, I hope this is uh, recording and that I have the privilege of being with all of you. I'm Father John Cusick and I've been affiliated with the First Friday Club since uh, the ancient 1986 when we got this going. Uh, and it has been a, a privilege of ours every four years to take a look at uh, the presidential election and how that blend, bleeds itself into the states where we live and the counties where we live and the cities where we live. And we, it has been our tradition to invite people who are in the know, who know an awful lot about a larger world than some of us do. Four years ago, we invited the same two people, affectionately known as Thelma and Louise in Chicago, uh, to give their look at the world uh, in which we live, and particularly the country, which is ours. And so we are honored today that uh, we have Mary Ann Ahern, and uh, next to her on my screen is the one and only Carol Marine. And uh, we're just thrilled, ladies, that, that you have given us time, and which I am sure is a very busy week uh, for all of us politically, Carol, for you personally. And uh, thank you for making time today. And um, I've been told that maybe the best thing we do is we do at the First Friday Club, whether at the, we're at the Union League Club or here we are scattered all over everywhere, is that we begin with a prayer. And I think uh, if you're like me, I've had a lot of prayer this week. I'll tell you, I'm wearing out the knees. And uh, so I, I'd like to just keep that going and take what we're going to do for the next 45 minutes or so and put it in God's hands. Uh, gracious God, we come before you on the first Friday of November. Um, so a lot going on in our lives. Some of it has been buried, believe it or not, by the politics of today and the presidential election, which continues. We put on the back burner, sadly, the health concerns of COVID-19. We need to pray for those who right now are struggling for breath. We pray for all of those who have not made it through this pandemic. May God rest their souls in everlasting peace. We pray for our own health and the ability we have by the mask we wear to show our respect for other people, to keep them as healthy as we can. Um, there's an awful lot of people that when the city and the state it continues to shut down who have lost their jobs again. Uh, gracious Lord, watch over them. Help them to hold their head high. We need to find some way, Lord, that, that we can try to sustain them financially uh, in these very difficult times. Um, obviously, we pray for our country. And whatever the outcome of this election is, Lord, I've got one real big request. I need to pray for peace. In our city, too many things are boarded up out of fear of violence. And this is across our country. This is not the land of the free and the home of the brave. This is people living in fear. Help us to live in brotherhood and sisterhood. Help black, white, brown, whatever color we are, to somehow see in each other the image of our God and that we are not divided as much as we are having so much in common. Bless our uh, two leaders today, Carol and Mary Ann, and the tremendous wisdom they are going to share with us. We put this day, this November, this pandemic, this political season in God's hands, and we pray, amen. amen. Mike. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Cahill, a member of the First Friday Board, and uh, thanks for being here. We believe we have 409 people uh, on the Zoom meeting. So we're grateful for all of you for coming. My job is to introduce uh, Marianne Ahern and Carol Marine, uh, which obviously they need absolutely no introduction. Um, so I am, I decided to dispense with the usual reading of their awards and accomplishments, which you can read online on any number of uh, published biographicals. Instead, what, what I want to say is this, growing up in the 60s and 70s, Walter Cronkite was regarded as the most trusted journalist, if not the most trusted person in America. And the reason was that he reeked of integrity. Marianne Ahern and Carol Marine are the most trusted journalists in Chicago. Two stories that speak to their integrity. In 1991, Marianne 
was one of the first, if not the first reporter to disclose the pre-sex abuse crisis in Chicago. Many of my Catholic friends, initially skeptical of the media's reporting, came to believe the reports simply because they found out that it was Marianne who was covering the story. Someone who had been involved in stories about the church in Chicago and beyond for many, many years and covered it with a sympathetic but objective eye. Chicago, Chicago trusts Marianne Ahern because of her integrity. In 1997, Carol Marine and Ron Majors resigned from NBC Channel 5. They had been fighting over the commingling of the news and sales department, and this culminated with the hiring of the noted and distinguished journalist, sarcasm noted, uh, Jerry Springer as a commentator. Um, Carol Marine's already high stock in Chicago rose to fever heights. Chicago trusts Carol Marine because of her integrity. I think that's all the introduction we need. Two minutes before we came on, my daughter came in with these numbers. Biden up 9,746 in Pennsylvania with 95% reporting. Biden up 1,560 with 98% reporting in Georgia. Biden up 43,779 with 93% reporting in Arizona. Biden up 20,352 with 92% reporting in Nevada. And finally, Trump up 76,737 with 95% reporting in North Carolina. The title for our talk, ladies, is What Happened? But of course, that's the wrong title. It's <laughs> What the Heck is Happening? Most commentators now seem to think Biden will pull out a narrow victory and get to 270. Uh, my initial question to you both is, is that the way you see it? What is happening? But more importantly, as John mentioned in his prayer, what do you think this portends uh, for our country? So we'll start there. Thank you very much, Mike. I'm worried. I'm worried because of the division, because of this enormous separation. And let's just, just an aside first, because I need to introduce my great friend and partner, Marianne Ahern. We are uh, called Thelma and Louise because though Mike, you very kindly said we are so trusted in <laughs> when Barack Obama was about to accept the nomination to become president in Colorado, his press secretary came upon Marianne and I as we were about to go live. And he looked at her and he looked at me and he said, <laughs> Thelma and Louise. He didn't mean it as a compliment <laughs> at all because politicians, no matter how faithfully Marianne and I believe that we were, try to report the news or priests for that matter, or anyone for that matter, there will always be people who are not in our fan club. But Marianne and I put our arms around the Thelma and Louise because we were proud of the work we do and not sorry about sometimes being viewed as too tough. So I start with sort of why the moniker. Secondly, let's just start, let's just start deconstructing this election, shall we? In Illinois, Joe Biden won Illinois. No surprise there, but it was a bad night for Joe Biden and Democrats in Illinois, why? How many counties did Hillary Clinton win in her failed bid to become president? She won only 11 of Illinois' 102 counties. How many did Joe Biden win? He won 11 of 102 counties. He didn't improve a lick on Hillary Clinton in this theoretically blue, blue state because there is still something in the undercurrent of our politics, in the distrust of everyone, Democrat or Republican, that dragged Biden down. And I think that that is something that in the soul searching of this election, which will come, the Democratic Party of Illinois better take a hard look at itself beyond just looking at what the Republicans are doing wrong. Don't you think, Marianne? 
Yes, Carol, I'd like to add, uh, and when we talk about that Thelma and Louise and that campaign, and I know you remember this, Barack Obama wins. He bases his uh, transition here in Chicago. And they have the news conferences periodically leading up to his inauguration here in Chicago. And so, of course, we get to go, and it's quite lovely to be a part of that. But the very first news conference where he announced his transition, and the reason I'm even bringing this up is everyone thinks, oh, Biden, it's going to be all new. It's going to be all better, and it's going to be no more fake news. And boy, we're going to get all the facts and, you know, let's just put all this rank or, or behind us. Well, let, if, we, if we go back to the Obama administration, that those news conferences, Carol and I are there together. And little did we realize as we were trying to, uh, excuse me, and uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. President-elect, you know, we were, uh, excuse, the rest of the White House press corps is giving us daggers looking at us like, how, who are you? And how dare you think that you get to ask a question? It, is, it was all pre-scripted. Yep. Obama had a list of who he was going to call on. Each time that he had one of these press conferences to announce you know, the Secretary of State and education and on and on, there was a list. And on the list at the very end was one Chicago reporter. And it took about at the very last, the very last announcement was finally my turn. And I knew it was going to, I mean, I, now I started to, of course, complain to that same Robert Gibbs and say, you know, what's the deal here? You know, like, come on, let us know what's going on. So yeah, I, I, I was prepared for that last day and literally 20 seconds before the president-elect called on me, I received a text that said, you're next. Well, that's kind of creepy, <laughs> if you ask me. So uh, let's just put that out there, that um, whether it's the Republicans or whether it's the Democrats, everyone wants to control the message and how it is delivered. Of course, it's been, it, it, we're, we're not going to lie, it's been pretty crazy these last four years. It has been. But don't look for you know a Biden administration not to also control the narrative as much as they possibly can. And I would say amen to that, John, wouldn't you? <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. So let's talk a little bit more about Democrats. Let's start with Mike Madigan, shall we? Mike Madigan is the cudgel that the Republicans have wielded against the Democrats across at least four recent elections that Marianne and I can recall. And I didn't do any good. They made stickers about him. They made t-shirts condemning him. They carried banners opposing him, but they never defeated him. In comes Mike Madigan. And now there's more heat on him than maybe there ever has been because of the federal government and the Commonwealth Edison admission that it was bribing Mike Madigan with patronage jobs. Madigan is not charged. We hasten to say, but he certainly is identified in that consent decree. Madigan in this election was expected, even so, since he's raised millions more in spite of the heat. People are still giving Mike Madigan money and he spent money and he spent a lot of money on a Supreme Court justice named Kilbride. And Justice Thomas Kilbride despite the vast amount of money that went his way, went to defeat. And the Republicans, in addition, picked up two more House seats, the things Madigan cares even more deeply about. So it's chipped into Madigan's supermajority. He still has it. But this has been a problem in Illinois um, for Mike Madigan, only recently, he is a winner all the time, but not quite yet. And why did Madigan pour that money into Justice Kilbride? Because the Supreme Court with Kilbride was a four Democrat, three Republican operation. This is 2020. This is when the census is read again, by which we figure out how to reapportion the districts in the state. And we're already gonna lose one Congressman. 
because our population is diminished. Madigan wants that court to be on the Democrat side, not the Republican side. So this is a, these are really critical big money fights that I think a lot of citizens um, need to pay more attention to than they do. Marianne? Carol, and I find it, here we uh, are talking about Madigan and finally, finally we hear from some very um, politicians who were unable to speak these words before the election. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Carol moderated the one and only US Senate debate that it had all of the candidates, including Dick Durbin. And when Dick Durbin was asked at that debate, where do you stand on Madigan? There was this very, I, you know, like, I, let's wait. Interesting. Well, Wednesday, he was done waiting. And Wednesday evening on WTTW, he said, uh, Madigan's a problem. And Madigan should no longer be the chairman of the state Democratic Party. And if that was not like a somewhat of a little bit of a political earthquake, I thought, whoa. Whoa, now he's got, you know, now he's got some uh, nerve to say it. And what happened the next day? Governor Pritzker and Tammy Duckworth said the same thing. And let, let, if I can interrupt, and let's remember, before the election, there were some brave women in the Illinois House who, at, at real political peril, stood up and said, they didn't say Madigan was guilty of anything. They didn't say that he should be judged based on the Commonwealth Edison. They just said that there are true problems now based on the heat of that with his continued chairmanship of the party and his Speaker of the House status. And they took a huge amount of heat. It was only after the election that you heard from Durbin or Duckworth or Pritzker in any definitive sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, and Madigan doubled down. He, he released a statement uh, last evening saying, I look forward to being the chairman of the party. And it does not sound as if he is going to step step away. So that that is going to come to a head at some point. How does the governor, with all of his money and the way that he has spent it on this graduated income tax and now believes that it was Madigan and the skepticism over politicians that really sent home a message. And they're blaming Madigan for that defeat, as well as Kilbride, as well as losing a couple of house seats. So there's sort of this trickle down effect that they're all putting on Mr. Madigan's shoulders. So hmm, are you the governor or are you not the governor? Uh, don't you at some point say, there's no choice here, you're done. Isn't, isn't one of the problems that Madigan has A, so much money, and B, whatever you think of him, good or bad, is an excellent organizer in terms of winning elections? And how dependent are the members of the state house and the state senate on Madigan? And it, it, do you think it's still too early to write his political obituary? Or do you think this is it? No, I think it's too soon to write his obituary. But I will say this, because in many ways, this is how we judge people. How much money do they have? How much clout do they have? How afraid are we of them? The fact of the matter is that Commonwealth Edison it got bipartisan support, I hasten to say. It wasn't just the Democrats voting for ComEd bills. It was the Republicans as well because they spread their money around. Was that good for the consumer? Was that good for the person who is paying an electric bill? Was that good for somebody who was dealing near one of the nuclear power plants? You know, who was looking out for whom and why? And I think those are crucial kinds of questions that we have to ask. The reason the Pritzker tax died, even though you could argue economically in terms of economic justice, probably a graduated income tax, is better for poor people and middle income people than what we have now. It died because citizens, the, there were two kinds of ads. One that said fairness, you'd pay le less taxes, billionaires would pay more. And then there was the other ad that said, do you trust lawmakers in Springfield to make a decision for you? It obscured the fact that they already get to set tax rates, they do. They already get to tax if they want your retirement income. They do. 
So this legislation had, or amendment, had nothing to do with making that different. But what it penetrated was the deep distrust of government. Government has made to be the goat of all things. Bruce Rauner did it when he argued government's no good. I know because I wasn't in government. I was a CEO. Well, congratulations. You know, I want a dentist who goes to dentist school. You know, I don't want a dentist who says, I don't trust dentists. I think I can do it better. And so there is a reason to know something about government. But the, the deep distrust of our politicians, the Republican governor that goes to prison, the Democratic governor that goes to prison, and all the others down ladder, have made the public so suspect, which, which also seeps in to the Trump-Biden scenario as well, I, I think. And I'd like to add, and this is really not my original idea, but it makes sense. And Carol and I were speaking earlier this week with a former state lawmaker who said, Governor Pritzker didn't really own this. Yes, he put in the money, put in tons of money, $56 million, but he didn't wear the jacket for the tax. And while he has high favorable ratings for how he has handled the virus, he didn't go that step further as he's traveled the state and really uh, rally, really lobby for, I need you on this. I need you to vote on this tax. And he left it up to his lobby group and the ads doing the talking. And I think in the end, uh, you know, you can't, you can't have it both ways. You gotta, if you're gonna own it, you gotta own it and go for it. And perhaps he saw the, the problem I had that it was, it was gonna have a very difficult time passing and he wanted to do sort of the step back of, oh, you know, it wasn't really my tax, even though we all know it, it was his idea. Let's also shift now to Kim Fox, state's attorney's race, generated a lot of attention and interest um, by way of history. Anita Alvarez, four years earlier, went to victory because of, or went to defeat rather, because of Laquan McDonald and the way she handled the Laquan McDonald prosecution or didn't move to prosecute until it was uh, too late for her politically. So Kim Fox won. Arriving Kim Fox, arriving Jussie Smollett. How did Fox handle Jussie Smollett? And was it a phone call from Tina Chen or Valerie Jarrett, a kind of influence from on high that made her rethink or retreat? She will never really say, but Michael Tooman, judge, appointed a special prosecutor to look into Kim Fox's handling of this case. It ends up developing a multi-layered scenario. Kim Fox takes a lot of heat for the way she handled or did not handle Smollett. Her godmother, Tony Preckwinkle, political godmother, took aim at the judge, Michael Tooman, who appointed the special prosecutor, Dan Webb. We still don't know the outcome of Tooman's judicial retention as a result of that. What we do know is that Lightfoot and Preckwinkle joined in favor of Kim Fox and she won. Lightfoot and Preckwinkle separated. Lightfoot supporting Tuman, Preckwinkle not. And we don't know Tuman's retention. Tuman has a very good judicial reputation. And so was it a revenge, an attempted revenge killing for what happened with Kim Fox? This is the, you know, Cook County politics is like an Agatha Christie sort of mystery novel. <laughs> You know, you're always trying to figure out who had the knife, who used the knife, and why. And that is part of the, the constellation of the state's attorney's race. Should we look at Congress as well? If we look yeah. at uh, yeah. <laughs> several of the congressional races, we know that um, the Caston and Ives race, as well as the Underwood and Oberweiss, those were the two in the suburbs, their first term Congress, uh, a Democrats who flipped this and uh, that is my phone and I am sorry and I tried to turn it off but it, I failed you their first re-election is always the tough first uh, test 
And uh, while Caston and Ives was perhaps a little closer than some had thought, Caston has been declared the winner. As far as Lauren Underwood and Jim Overweiss, we are still going to have to wait for all the mail-in votes, the provisional votes. Jim Overweiss says he won. And Lauren Underwood, and he is ahead. Lauren Underwood believes that when the mail-in votes are counted that she will hold on to that seat. But it is, if she does, it's gonna be by a hair. Mm -hmm. and will likely set her up for another very tough contest in two years. And that district is even more so Republican probably than uh, the sixth, than the Caston, um, the Caston Ives race. But you know, the, the suburbs have turned a little more purple. Downstate there, it was the rematch of Rodney Davis and Betsy, Lond Betsy Dirksen Londergren. She did not. I thought it was gonna be closer, Carol, didn't she? I did too, I, and she had so much money. Um, I mean, it was it was staggering, but but again, it was I think the Trump voters who carried Rodney Davis um, to victory. Rodney Davis, who had COVID nineteen, who recovered from it, who has unfailingly supported President Trump. I mean, it is an interesting uh, outcome. But I thought Betsy Dirksen Londrigan had a shot this time, and she didn't. And then in the far western reaches of Illinois is uh, Sherry Bustos, who everyone believes is, you know, uh, perhaps U.S. Senate candidate when uh, Dick Durbin maybe somehow decides to retire at, at some point down the road. Who knows? But she had a very close, but she's in a district that has always been a very, very difficult uh, battleground. And last time voted for Trump, her district did, and yet she survived. And then right. that was the case again this time. Her dad was Gene O'Callaghan, who worked for Alan Dixon and worked for Paul Simon. And, um, you know, Gene Callahan was an was a old, by the book Democrat. And Sherry Bustop's kitchen table was surrounded by Paul Simon and Al Dixon, and you know, and and Dick Durbin. So she's kind of like Dick Durbin's goddaughter, in a way, and and is loved. And she ended up in leadership in the D Triple C. In a sense, she's going to have to wear the jacket too for how these congressional races worked out because she was the one who was telling the Democrats, you need to be more mainstream. You need to be more in the middle, not so much to the left. And, um, and she got, she's winning or won, but she was beaten up by this. And it has been a, it's been a terrible test. You think she got more steam the longer she was in Congress? Not this time. Carol and uh, Marianne, one of the questions that just came in, uh, which actually my wife and I were talking about this morning, uh, my wife said to me, you know, even if Biden wins, uh, he could be running against Trump again in four years. Do you think Trumpism is going to be around for the next four years, uh, in including Trump himself, uh, assuming Biden does uh, win? I certainly do think that Trump will be around. I mean, he is not going to go off into the good night quietly. Now, will in four years, will be he be around? Hmm. That's sort of hard to, to know this early on, but I do think as long as he, and as long as anyone gives him the megaphone, he's going to be speaking loudly in it. So yes, it, there is, the, the Republican party is going to have to figure out its direction. What, what now, if not Trump who, where, and, and there's plenty of uh, hands being raised right now of more moderate Republicans who would say, yes, you know, I, I, John Kasich, why do you think he's on CNN every other minute? You know, he, he's trying to gear himself up as long and, and probably many others that I can't say their name right this minute because I can't think of them. But he comes to mind right away as this moderate uh, Republican voice who desperately would love to be the next president. So. And Joe Biden at 78, I, I, I would find it hard to believe at 82 that he's gonna run another campaign. But hey, it, it, I'm not the know-all be-all, Carol, what about you? No, I mean, I don't know either. What's been interesting in the reordering of some of the universe has been that Fox News recently has, the president's former favorite network has been denounced soundly lately because Fox News is the one that called Arizona when no one, no other network has yet to do so. 
And when their pollster came on and kind of apologized for saying, this is what the numbers look to me, um, I think it was, I'm trying, I'm trying to think, what, Brett Baer, I think, said, don't apologize. You know, information is, is information. Fox News has two parts to it. It has all the opinion people, the Sean Hannity's and the, that crowd. But it's also got Chris Wallace and Brett Baer and people who do some serious straight up news. The crucible I think that Fox News is in, which has peddled as hard as it can that we're all fake news people except them, is that Donald Trump right now may not be their best friend again, and they might not want the friendship any longer. And there was always the theory that Trump, if he did lose this election, would go off into a Breitbart kind of world and create another alternative network, an even more conservative than Fox News opinion network. And if I can just add one other thing, and this is, this is my campaign, maybe for life. Our business, Mary Ann's and mine, has done a terrible job with media literacy of helping people understand that MSNBC is not Lester Holt's nightly news. That CNN has opinions all commingled with actual straight news. That Fox, same thing, a news wing that's utterly overshadowed by the opinion people. And until we help explain to people, the Tribune did a good thing recently, took all of its columnists, dumped them off the news pages and threw them in an opinion section. That's where they all belong, you know? So we keep explaining to people what we do. We tell the story, whether you wanna hear it or not, but we don't, Marianne didn't report the Catholic church and its crisis as a Catholic girl. She was a Catholic girl. She reported it as a journalist. And the archdiocese was down her throat and still is to this day because they won't forgive her for being a reporter as well as a Catholic. And we believe in the separation of church and state in our politics, in our political reporting, and in our news reporting. End of sermon, go in peace. You know, you, men you mentioned the, um the issue of the media. And when I was growing up, it, it was a different thing. Well, you, what's the history? How did how did it get so commingled so that now, unless you're really literate, as you say, uh, people don't know when they're getting fact or opinion? What, what happened? And, and do you have any strategies on, on how to fix it? I do think that some of it has been driven by social media. Uh, the Facebook, the uh, Twitter, the ability to um, give sort of constant, no deadline news and just constant telling what's going on and not taking the breath to think about, okay, what is the big story? What happened today? And how did, it, how did that all come about? Because that doesn't happen so much. We, we really don't have deadlines anymore. It, the deadlines are constant. And with all of that pressure to be first, be first, be first, and not necessarily be right, and maybe worry about being first later. Uh, I do think, you know, it, it, I am, it sounds crazy to talk about this, but my mother, you said, oh, honey, you have too many choices. I didn't have as many choices. And it's sort of that, you know, that there's just so many choices out there. And uh, instead of, knowing which ones are reputable, people are, are caught up in sort of the gossip line instead of the facts. So Mike, um, you just keep interrupting us if there are questions that people- Yeah, I, I wanna, I, I should have said earlier, but uh, there's a Q&A on your, on your Zoom. And if you wanna type a question into Q&A, we won't get to them all, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. Let me just look and see what we got here. Uh, we have a question. Can you speculate, uh, if, is, can Trump still win this election? And do you think it will end up in court? I have a long way to answer that question. So in 1980, reporting for WMAQ, I was assigned to the Rich Daily 
Bernie Carey state's attorney race. And I was at daily headquarters full of Bridgeport firemen who were just, you know, looking for a fight. And the assumption was that Kerry would win. And on channel seven that night sat Mike Royko, the legendary Mike Royko as a commentator. And he said, uh, as the ABC seven pollster said, I'm calling it, I'm calling it for Bernie Carey, the Republican. He's going to win. And Royko said, really? Took out his watch, which had one of those, cal- those old watches that used to have calculators. And he goes, what precincts are out? And he goes, tap, 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 tap. And he looks over at the anchors and he says, fire your pollster. <laughs> well, at four o'clock in the morning, when those Bridgeport firemen were kind of fired up and were ready to physically pick me up and throw me off the platform where I was reporting, Rich Daly won that race. I really do think that going to Donald Trump, could he win? You know, until it's all counted. And this is where I think people are being very wise and saying, we're not gonna declare until the people declare, until we count the votes, the provisionals, the absentees, the mail-ins, Every state has a different threshold for how they do it. Until we do that, we don't know. So I'm not going to be one of those people who says, I I know the outcome because I learned the hard way. You don't do that. I do find it interesting that the Biden team has taken on this air of inevitability. Mm -hmm. The, you know, he spoke first on Wednesday afternoon he um, will apparently be speaking tonight. There is a prime time address is what we're hearing. Um, they quickly posted online the Biden transition team report. And so you want to give this sort of air of confidence and don't worry, we got this under control. He, he had a briefing on the virus yesterday. And it's completely opposite of what we're seeing with the current president, who already, as the incumbent, has all those trappings of the presidency. Heck, he's in the he's in the White House, he's in the Oval Office, and yet we haven't seen photos of him perhaps taking calls or meeting with his pandemic team or doing any of the to keep the the gears moving. And so that does give this speculation of oh. He, he doesn't know what to do. He must have lost. He's got, what, why, why is he acting this way? So, you know, a lot of this is also uh, perception. And it happened as well with Bush uh, Gore um, and, and that race and what was going on and the Bush team just moving right along, acting like, hey, you know, I don't care how many hanging chads there are. We, we won Florida. We won this thing. So will it end up in court? Perhaps. Uh, it just is going to depend on how close that vote in Pennsylvania is probably the most important right now. If it's you know, more than 50,000, more than 100,000 votes that Biden wins there in Pennsylvania, then I think that is, gives everyone a little more, uh, all right, I, I believe this is the way it is going to end. And let's hasten to say, when the president says, we're gonna take this right to the Supreme Court, where I have the most nominees right now, or the most sitting justices, you can't just walk into the Supreme Court and say, I don't trust this election, do something. Every state governs its own elections. The place you start your filing your lawsuits are in those states. And it's gonna take a little while to jump into Washington and the Supreme Court on a good day. Carol, that being said, is there any way then that somebody could postpone the inauguration on 20 January because there's lawsuits out, uh, outstanding. I suppose theoretically, I, I think that there is a, a huge and growing investment on the part of Republicans and Democrats to find a tally and put an end to this. That, you know, it. I don't want to base things on late night TV. Stephen Colbert did something really interesting last night. It was very serious. He sort of broke down that this is toxifying the most sacred institution we have in government. It's the individual's right to vote and to pick their leaders. 
and to do it fairly and legally. And so I don't, I don't see the inauguration, John, being postponed unless mayhem breaks out in this country. But I, and I think it would be a dark day if it is postponed because the whole world is watching. The whole right. world is watching. And, um, and we have a plague that is killing our people. And that needs to be addressed and the crashing economy of those people needs to be uh, lifted up. And so I, I think there will be forces that will inveigh against it. Marianne. Marianne and Carol, there was a, uh, a hope among Democrats that there'd be a blue wave and that we'd have a House, Senate, and presidency all blue. Uh, clearly, uh, the House will remain blue. But one of the questions that came in is, uh, does Pelosi have a jacket to wear? Because she is going to lose, I, I don't know the exact number, but she's going to maintain the majority, but she's going to lose a number of seats, even in the House. She's sort of in the same spot that Mike Madigan, only you know, in a much bigger scale, obviously, of losing some of those, uh, just a couple of races as he did. And um, also, uh, not obviously, she's not in the midst of a scandal, but there are folks who have called for her departure before. And yet, um, I have not heard another name. Now, maybe there is going to be someone who speaks up and says, you know, I think it's time. Um, certainly the uh, AOC, those who support a, a more liberal uh, democratic uh, agenda would, would want someone else new. But from what everyone that we talked to in DC says, there's no one who knows how to count. There's no one who knows how to get what she needs to get done. And it, it, you know, like her or hate her, uh, she is effective. And so I do not hear Nancy Pelosi, especially with if it is President Biden, she's not about to step aside at this point. Carol and, and, and Marianne, Marianne, when you began, you, one of your opening lines was that you're worried because there's such an enormous division. Um, the things I've read this week are this state of division in our country. The last time it was this bad or was the Civil War. Um, and I claim we've never gotten over that division. Um, 155 years later, we still had to take down a flag that has inside of it the crest of the Confederacy. So it's a long way of saying, is there any on the horizon? Are there people, men and women, Democrats, Republicans, who can stand shoulder to shoulder and say, Let's get over this a little bit. Let's begin to model a behavior that talks about, as Barack said many years ago, not red states, blue states, but the United States. Is there any way that you see on the horizon moving beyond this, as you call it, enormous division? It's going to take some time, John. It's going to take a lot of time. I, there's divisions within my own family. There's oh, discussions. all of us. Yeah. yeah discussions that are, you know, that get to a shouting tone of, uh, you know, the folks can't see beyond each other. And uh, I would be Pollyanna to say that, wow, we're going to be all in, in uh, you know, kumbaya land soon. I, no, I don't think, but I do, you know, the tone is set at the top. The tone is set at the top. There's, that, how can we not say that it made us uh, it cringe when we heard some of the statements of the president in the last four years. And I don't think that's being political. I, I, I'm just saying that it was hard to hear some of those uh, of, of how he spoke about other people or people that didn't agree with him. And so I think we won't be seeing quite that tone should it be a President Biden. That doesn't mean that there aren't people who still feel that same way. So um, it comes back to individual responsibility. And, if, and, and despite uh, what others, we have to obviously model the best behavior that we can and call out a lie when we hear a lie and not, and not focus on all of that. I, I, I think that's been, you know, it, at the beginning of the Trump campaign, everyone rushed to have him on. You know, the Today Show used to have him on by phone. We have Donald Trump on, you know, and, da, 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 da. and he was just this fascinating character that everyone, 
was just, wow, did he, whoa, did you hear what he said now? And oh my gosh. And it, it, it sort of created, his, I hate to say his own monster, but it was, I mean, it, it fueled this fire at where it didn't know where to stop. It didn't have a, it didn't have a sort of threshold of, mm, that's enough. And, you know, it, it, it's a, the pendulum swings both ways and there'll be a bit of a correction now uh, if it is President Biden as it appears it will be. But it, that certainly doesn't mean that the other, other views aren't out there. Let's just have a little more respect. Wouldn't that be nice? <sighs> Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I just don't see it ending. I, I'm usually the optimist, but I'm also a Chicago kid and I I know how things get done and I don't know how this one gets done. Uh, there's just no trust. And what I see in the country, you know, uh, politically, I see in the Catholic Church religiously, that it's, <clears throat> in, and the difference there is there's the, the guy in the top of the Catholic Church is much more conciliatory, it seems, but the brutality of language uh, towards one another, even in the Catholic Church, just models what's going on in the country politically. Uh, and I don't know how you, you're going to get around either one because, you know, everybody's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, right. That's right. You know, uh, I have had a, an interesting relationship with whom I call my rabbi, Alan Setcher, who lives out in Montana now, but. Uh, Rabbi and a priest, we've gotten together, I don't know how many times, we, we've never had an argument because we realize it's not right and wrong. It's about how do you perceive life and how do I perceive life based on the tra traditions we come out of. And there's been great value in that for me personally. And I would just love to get in a conversation politically and say, how do you look at this? Let me tell you how I look at that. And we can walk away shaking hands or putting a scotch, putting scotch over a bunch of ice, but we can't. We have to have a platform, and and I'm afraid to say it, but I will. That this man in Washington has just taken division and capitalized every letter in the word. Uh, he thrives on it, um, and we've got to get beyond that, where we can have a conversation with our enemies and not let them be seen as enemies. Isn't it interesting, John, that we, we viewed for a long time the, the power brokers in Washington, like Danny Rostenkowski, Henry Hyde, Ronald Reagan, and said, oh, they make, you know, they make these backroom deals. The truth was they, they really disagreed with each other. They could fight like cats and then they could call it a day and go have a drink and a steak and talk to each other as human beings. I think there is less of that. And there is less of people in Washington knowing one another outside of the confines of Congress or outside of the four corners of what they believe is their constituency. And so there is a little less humanity in their relationships and COVID-19 has reinforced our separations too. I mean, Zoom is a wonderful thing and, and thank God that we have it, but it's a pretty antiseptic way to reach one another uh, when you'd rather just go have a drink or have a cup of coffee and, and talk. So I'm, I'm, I refuse to not be optimistic, but, um, but it is a test. It is a test. One of the questions that just came in about that division, uh, Marianne and Carol, is to what extent do you think it's rooted in uh, racial hostilities and resentments? Hugely. Hugely. I think John's right. I don't think we've, we're really done with civil war. Um, we've gotten better on some levels, but look at the city of Chicago. You know, if I take you uh, to North Lawndale, or the Austin neighborhood, you're going to see places, um, especially in, in Austin, that are, have never recovered from the King riots. You know, and then they were, they were torn apart again this last time. So there isn't economic prosperity. There isn't a strong enough black middle class. 
Hispanic middle class. And in, in this city, we're almost driving out all of the middle classes. Um, you're either rich or you're poor, and there isn't as much in between. And that is, uh, creates a social chasm that is really hard to, uh, to deal with, I think. Another oh. question regarding race that came in was, uh, it appears that Trump uh, made some inroads with Hispanics, uh, particularly, of course, in Florida with the Cuban vote, but, but even in some of the other states. And uh, do you have any sense of how sustainable that is, is the question. Cuban vote has been more conservative and has been more Republican for years. And that's why um, then look at Arizona and uh, the Biden Latino vote in, in Arizona is more uh, Joe Biden. So it is, it's an interesting mix. It's, it's sort of like saying they're all Hispanics are going to favor one or no, there's, there, you know, there's, there's Puerto Rican, there's Cuban, there's Mexican, there's, uh, you know, Latino. It, it, so it, it, I do, I do find it interesting that uh, the Florida Cubans uh, have said, Hey, you know, we got here, we did it our way. We, we followed the rules. And uh, no thanks to those folks who are trying to sneak through if, if that's what they think they're doing. Um, and yeah, so no, uh, the Latino vote is not monolithic. Another question just came in back at the state level, which I think is fascinating is assuming that maybe we are reaching the end of the Madigan era, are there on both sides of the aisle uh, young leaders who might uh, step in and, and lead Illinois? And, and who might they be if you think there are any? There aren't a lot that jump to mind. And part of it is that they, they've lived in their own world of political suppression for so long. I mean, you at your peril rise um, to be different than Mike Madigan. I mean, there are, there are floor leaders, there are smart people. Um, and, and I look forward to them being groomed. There are some women who have have stood up. Uh, when the Me Too thing happened and when Madigan was confronted with what was going on in his own office of the intimidation and harassment of women, um, while he will say he acted and acted quickly, you know, Marianne and I've been down in Springfield. We know what Springfield is like. <clears throat> Springfield is a giant fraternity house. And it's, you know, not a sorority house, I hasten to say. But a fraternity house. And so that kind of, those atmospherics are, are going to continue, I think. But are there young, smart political people on both sides of the aisle? I believe there are. But I don't think they've been nurtured. There isn't a lot of political nourishment for the newcomers when the old guard is, is uh, standing against them. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's all I can really say. I, um, Before we leave, can I just, well, I want to make sure that we don't uh, forget to say that tonight will be Carol's last night at NBC at six o'clock. So I do hope that uh, those of you who are able to tune in at 6 p.m., um, you know, she doesn't know what we have planned, but let me tell you that you might need a Kleenex. It is, uh, you know, the best of, which is pretty hard to whittle down. <laughs> we could have done the entire newscast about my dear Louise. And um, uh, from the day I met her in 1988, I was a reporter in Atlanta, covering the campaign and I saw her at an airport and I said, oh, oh my gosh, that's Carol Marie. And I walked up to her and said, can I send you my tape? Can I send you my tape? I want to work in Chicago again. I had grown up in Michigan City. I'd been a teacher in Chicago, left to go on this crazy journey of Peoria, Atlanta. And then, uh, and it was truly meeting Carol in this fortuitous moment uh, and meeting another reporter, Paul Hogan, same thing. He was covering the Pope. I did, I walked up to him and said the same. And Paul and Carol, who were dear friends, whether they realized it or not, they were my <laughs> godfathers. You know, they were the ones 
that mentioned my name to the news director. And to think that after all these years, uh, there is absolutely no one more generous with her time and her support with contacts. The one who talks me off the ledge, as you can probably tell, she's steady Eddie. I'm a little bit, ah, uh, you know, says, so dial it down, dial it down, dear. Offer it up, dial it down. Uh, you know, it has been uh, the honor of a lifetime to have shared this beat with Carol Marie. Absolutely ah, amazing, amazing. Oh, stop it. <laughs> uh, you're Carol, gonna make, I'm, you got me crying now. And you know, I am working really hard at walking off this broadcast stage um, you know, as high a heel as possible, but you know, um, not with too many Kleenex. But we were a team, Marianne Ahern and I and Don Mosley um, are the Thelma, Louise and Brad Pitt, uh, <laughs> the producer Brad Pitt of the operation. And, um, and it really is, it's, it's the best job I can possibly imagine because we learn something every day. We meet people we otherwise wouldn't meet. We work with people like Mary Ann Ahern who confront her own Catholic church in the name of fairness and journalism. Mm -hmm. You know, it it's, um, gets said often and it loses some of its meaning, but I really mean it. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. Carol, um, before we depart, uh, one of the problems with Zoom is that we can't have 409 people give you a standing ovation. But, uh, but if we could, I'm sure that we would. And I'm going to pass it to John Cusick, who's going to close us out. Yeah. Carol, uh, Mike Cahill, in the beginning, that talked about the day that you and Ron Majors walked off of NBC. And we had you booked the following Friday which was like three days later, the first time ever to speak at the First Friday Club. And I was getting calls from people saying, do you think Carol Marine will show up? I said, of course she will show up. She's a person of integrity. She made a commitment. Well, I'm not sure you remember, we were at the Red Lacquer Room that time in the Palmer House. You could not get near the building, never mind the Red Lacquer Room. And there were all those mini cams in those days backed up there. Well, lo and behold, the day before, and you and not are aware of this, uh, who do I get a call from? Bob Collins, GN. And Bob Collins calls me up and says, uh, Father, do you think you might be able to squeeze me into the Carol Marine talk at the first Friday Club? I said, Bob, no worries. Do you think she'll be there? I said, I will bet my life that Carol Marine will be there. And that's the kind of Carol Marine that I've seen personally and through on a screen like today, a person of integrity. And I am so honored that the woman with you today is a similar person. She we need Mary Ann, great journalism in this city. We've got all kinds of partisanship, but God, do we need journalists. Is it any wonder then that the media in many ways has always been called the fourth estate is something very, very special. And Carol has witnessed that and her, her sun is setting and yours is still bright in the sky. And uh, may we all learn from both of you and may I pray at the age of 75 to have the integrity that Carol Marine has witnessed in my life and in my faith and in my priesthood. Uh, and those are important things to me. And so um, with that being said, we've covered a lot of ground today, Carol, and I've got about what, how many? I've got till six o'clock. I got five hours and one minute until <laughs> I'll see you again. And uh, Marianne will be there. And can I thank the both of you uh, from all the 400 and some people who take us a, from a journey through Illinois, uh, around the state, different offices that the people are running for, to the presidency, to the undertones of our country, to the hopes we have as a democracy. Uh, in the midst of everything and pray that somehow the craziness of division can give way to the promise of communion. Uh, 
Thank you both for all of us. And Carol, Godspeed. Uh, and I got a hunch. I won't say that. We're going to, well, somehow a lot of us will stay in touch one way or another. Absolutely, and, we will. Thank yeah. you all. Old St. Pat's and the First Friday Club have been, uh, been the greatest institutions in this city. So thank you very much, all of you. And thank you, you, Thelma, I'll be seeing you a little later today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And can I give a little push here now next month, Ibu Patel, um, who was the founder of the uh, uh, Interfaith Youth Corps is, interestingly, he's got a topic that morphs after today. It's called Beyond Judeo-Christian, Building Interfaith America in an Era of Division. Interestingly, the more divided we become, the people of our country are breaking down religious barriers and marrying each other. Uh, and so it's not red states and blue states and Muslims and Catholics and Jews, but it's called love. And if, if a Democrat can marry a Republican, if a Muslim can marry a Jew, then by God, there's hope for our country. And Ibu, <laughs> Ibu is a brilliant young man, and uh, we've had him before. And please join us uh, on Friday, December 4th. As they say in the mother tongue of Latin America, adios. See you later. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.